Good evening, I'm Diane Lewis, and I'm the Chief Programming Officer and EVP of the Paley Center for Media. And it's my really great pleasure to welcome all of you to this very timely Paley Impact event from the Cuban Missile Crisis to Ukraine. How television has captured U.S.-Russia Russia relations over 60 years. We are excited to bring back our Impact events live and in person for the first time in three years. Our Paley Impact programs explore how media influences attitudes, behaviors, and actions that shape public understanding on critical social issues. Now, it takes a lot of support to make impact events like this possible. This program is made possible by the generous support from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. And we are incredibly grateful to Jean and Scott Kaur for all that they do. Tonight's event is presented in partnership with the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. We are pleased that the executive director of the foundation is with us tonight, Rachel Floor. Tonight, we are examining the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, one of the most dangerous confrontations between the United States and the then Soviet Union. Tonight, our panel of experts and journalists will discuss how the relationship between the US and Russia has been captured on television and radio over 60 years. Unfortunately, one of our Russian scholars, Nina Khrushcheva, Khrushcheva is ill and will not be able to join us tonight. Now is my great pleasure to introduce Tatiana Sloshberg, who will talk about the historic significance of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Tatiana is an award-winning journalist and former New York Times science writer. She is a board member of the JFK Library Foundation and the granddaughter of President John F. Kennedy. Please welcome Tatiana Sloshberg. Watch your step. <laughs> Good evening. Um, thank you, Diane, and thank you all very much for coming. I am grateful to the Paley Center for having us and to the Lori Foundation for their support of this program. Um, every day I give thanks for Rachel Floor, the executive director of the JFK Library Foundation, for her excellent stewardship of President Kennedy's legacy. I would also like to thank our moderator and all of our esteemed panelists for being here and enlightening us on this um, important subject. As I'm sure you all know, we are meeting just before the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Our moderator, Beth Noble, will introduce the other panelists. Um, and let's all just pretend that Dr. Khrushcheva is here, because otherwise the rest of my remarks don't totally work. But um, uh, I have to acknowledge Dr. Nina Khrushcheva. Thank you for being here uh, and for all the work <laughs> that you do to illuminate the relationship between Russia and the United States. An anniversary such as this one gives us an opportunity to reflect on the lessons of the past, to remember that history is contingent, its outcomes are not predetermined. <coughs> to be sharing this space with you tonight uh, embodies that lesson, since it is entirely possible that if my grandfather and your great-grandfather had been different people, none of us would be here today. I am grateful that they, along with many others, forged peace from the crude metal of war and made the world a safer place for all children, including their own. Um, as a granddaughter of President Kennedy, but merely an amateur historian, I did have to do some preparation for my remarks tonight. Um, I was rereading President Kennedy's speech at American University in 1963, which he gave as he and Chairman Khrushchev were negotiating what would become the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. In it, President Kennedy described the kind of peace he hoped would become, quote, the necessary rational end of rational men. He said, quote, every thoughtful citizen who despairs of war and wishes to bring peace should begin by looking inward, by examining his own attitude toward the possibilities of peace, toward the Soviet Union, toward the co course of the Cold War, and toward freedom and peace here at home. Today, as Russia continues to wage war in Ukraine, it is the collective responsibility, as President Kennedy said, for every thoughtful citizen to work towards a lasting peace, to carry on his legacy and the legacy of Chairman Khrushchev, to learn from their examples by examining our own attitudes and believing in the possibility of peace. Um, I am also here tonight as a journalist, and I am honored and humbled to be among such celebrated practitioners of our craft um, and eager to learn from you both. Um, while we meet here tonight to discuss the world historical importance of U.S.-Russia relations, um, I'm heartened to see that we have truly learned the, that crucial lesson of our field, uh, to never forget that we're the real story here. Um, Ha, 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 okay. Um, <laughs> um, but sometimes we really do need to look at media to understand the story and why certain narratives form, so I'm very glad to have the opportunity to do so. 
Um, I would like to close with some of President Kennedy's words from that same speech at American University, which we would all do well to remember in these dark days of war and division. If we cannot end our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those powerful words. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our moderator for the evening, Beth Noble. Beth is an associate professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University in New York. Before joining the Fordham faculty in 2007, she spent 14 years working in Russia as a journalist, most of it as the Moscow bureau chief for CBS News. Beth received an Emmy Award for coverage of the 2002 hostage taking at a Moscow theater and Edward R. Murrow and Sigda, Sigma Delta Chi Awards for coverage of the 2004 Beslan School Siege. Please welcome Beth Noble. Thanks. Lucian, Joe, please come up, join me. We should be getting uh, Marvin Kalb, who you just heard, uh, on the screen in just a moment. Hello, Marvin. Hello there, Beth. How are you, my dear? Pretty good. Uh, before <laughs> we talk about um, that clip in which we heard you, of course, we didn't see you because it was 1962 and the technology was quite primitive compared to today, <coughs> um, allow me to introduce our panelists. Uh, I'll start with Lucian Kim here uh, on my right. Lucian is a journalist who's covered Russia since Vladimir uh, Putin's first term in office. Uh, he worked as the business editor of the Moscow Times, that's the English language daily in Moscow. Uh, he covered energy and politics for Bloomberg News, and, uh, and many of you have heard him as NPR's Moscow uh, bureau chief from 2016 to 2021. Uh, Lucian has traveled in Putin's pool as the only foreign reporter. He's interviewed opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Uh, he's reported from across Russia and the former Soviet Union. In 2014, Lucian was in Crimea when the Russian troops arrived, and he covered the first phase of that uh, invasion of Ukraine. He's currently a global fellow at the Wilson Center in Washington. So Lucian, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, Joe Weisberg grew up in Chicago. He attended Yale and then worked uh, for the CIA in the early 1990s. He later worked as a novelist and a teacher. Um, and then he created FX Network's critically acclaimed Emmy-winning drama series, The Americans, uh, on which he served as the co-showrunner. Uh, the show has not only been widely acclaimed, it's one of the rare shows to win two, count them, two Peabody Awards, which is broadcasting's highest honor. Uh, his current project is the limited series The Patient, star starring Steve Carell, uh, which he wrote and executive produced alongside uh, his partner from the Americans collaborator Joel Fields. Uh, Joe is also the author of Russia Upside Down, a personal look at relations between the U.S. and Russia uh, during the Soviet period and almost to the present day. So welcome, Joe. Mm -hmm. Marvin Kalb uh, is a non-resident senior fellow with the Foreign Policy Program, program at Brookings and a senior advisor at the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting. Uh, many of you know him as a foreign, uh, former uh, chief diplomatic correspondent for CBS News and for NBC News, the former host of uh, Meet the Press. His work focuses on the impact of media on public policy and politics, and he's also an expert in national security with a focus on U.S. relations with Russia, Europe, and the Middle East. His latest book, which is wonderful, is called Assignment Russia, Becoming a Foreign Correspondent in the Crucible of the Cold War. It was published by Brookings last year. It's one of a series of three memoirs, two of which are written, and one of which is in the process of being written now um, that Marvin has, is sharing about his storied career. So to all three of you, a warm welcome. Uh, <laughs> I'll add one more personal note. The reason uh, that Marvin and I greeted each other is that he was, in fact, the uh, supervisor of my dissertation uh, on the uh, coverage of Gorbachev by American television. So we go back uh, a little way. 
So Marvin, we just saw you or heard you reporting about um, the Cuban Missile, rice, uh, Cuban missile Crisis. Uh, for those of us who uh, might not have been there, um, <laughs> meaning everyone under the age of 60, can you take us back to those 13 days and what it was like for America and for the Soviet Union and the world to be holding its breath during this time of, of near nuclear catastrophe? That's one of the things to bear in mind, I think, first, is that Russia in those days was a world entirely different from the rest of the world. It was the leader of the communist movement. It was involved in a crisis with China over who would lead the movement. Khrushchev himself was a very flamboyant, uh, irascible, fascinating person to cover, but he was given to restlessness and irritability. And at a time in May of 1962, he was in Bulgaria and somebody pointed out to him that there were American Jupiter missiles in Turkey pointing at the Soviet Union. And he got this idea in his head and he turned to Malinovsky, his defense minister, and he said, Roger, why don't we put a hedgehog in Uncle Sam's pants? And what he meant by that, why not, if they can have their missiles close by pointing at us, why can't we have our missiles close to the United States pointing at them? We can in that way balance the strategic unbalance at the moment in high long range nuclear missiles. Malinovsky thought the idea from what we were able to gather was terrible. He didn't have the guts to say that to Khrushchev. And Khrushchev then launched this really wild idea that you're gonna be able to take nuclear missiles, medium range, intermediate range missiles, move them into Cuba, across the Atlantic Ocean, along with 50,000 troops. And you're gonna be able to do this without the United States knowing anything about it. Well, of course it was an absurd idea, but nobody was prepared to take him on. And the Soviet Union then moved from a defensive to an offensive strategy, which was incredibly dangerous. And back of it all in Khrushchev's mind, I believe, was Berlin, which was an irritant to him. He wasn't able to resolve that issue. How could he do it? He thought by raising tension so high, there would be another summit meeting at which he could propose the withdrawal of those missiles from Cuba if the West would get its forces out of West Berlin. I think that was the deal in the back of his mind. Of course, it blew apart. And October 22nd, when Kennedy made that remarkable, tough speech, Khrushchev realized then and there that he had massively underestimated Kennedy, badly estimated him. He, he went back to thinking of Vienna in June of 1961, when Khrushchev felt in meeting Kennedy that he could take him to the cleaners. That was a fundamental miscalculation that led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. He thought he could take Kennedy. When he heard that speech, he realized he had blundered massively. The question then was, how do we avoid a nuclear war? So we did avoid a nuclear war, thankfully. When you look back at it, what was the, the, the key to getting out of that situation? Uh, you know, and I, I think we're all thinking about this, and we'll come to this at the end, and thinking about Ukraine, where there's a war going on with possible nuclear escalation, where there isn't a really clear exit ramp for how we get out of it. So let's go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. What was responsible for us getting out of that without a nuclear incident? My feeling then and now even more powerfully is that once Khrushchev realized that he had made a very bad blunder, the question was, how do you avoid a nuclear war at the same time maintain your political position? The first opportunity was to grab anything that came his way and Bertrand Russell, 
on Wednesday of that week came in with an idea, uh, why not have a summit? Heck, he embraced that immediately. There were a couple of little indications on Tuesday that something was on his mind. I was very lucky, very fortunate, went to the Bolshoi on Tuesday night for an American opera star, um, Jerome Hines. He was doing Boris Goodenough. I thought it was absurd to leave the CBS office to go to an opera, but my wife thought it was a good idea, and so I did. Who was there? Khrushchev. After um, the opera was finished, Khrushchev went backstage in order to congratulate Jerome Hines. I followed him. And Khrushchev saw me and he knew me, so he said nothing uh, to dissuade my following him. Went into this dressing room with him and Hines, their wives, and Khrushchev said, I don't want to be long, but I want to tell you Thank you so much for what you've done. This is a wonderful opportunity to say thanks to an American artist. And then he said, we will find a rational solution to all problems facing us. And he looked at me, I looked at him and I said, Cuba, and he walked right past me. But that was very much in my mind. Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, he leaped at the opportunity for a summit, Uthant came in with a two week proposition a couple of days later. He was searching Khrushchev for some way of saving face and getting the missiles out and avoiding a war. And there was a lot of back and forth with letter writing. There was a lot of miscalculation. There was a lot of fear, but at the end of the day, it came down to on Saturday night, Khrushchev faced a very real dilemma. Castro, he thought, was going out of his mind. Castro was pressing him to launch a thermonuclear attack on the United States, something Khrushchev did not want to do. The next thing was that Khrushchev had the day before said something that was kind of soft and easy, and perhaps if Kennedy bit, we might be able to get a deal. Kennedy did not bite because of the intrusion of the Turkey problem with its missile, the Jupiter missile. And finally, on Sunday night, Khrushchev got word that Kennedy was prepared to attack Cuba Sunday or at the latest Monday morning. At that point, Khrushchev and the entire Politburo sat down and literally wrote a letter. And it was the letter of absolute capitulation, which was sent overnight uh, to the White House. And at 5 p.m. Moscow time on Sunday, I happened to be the only reporter at the Central Telegraph. And Yuri Levitan, who was this fellow who spoke and made only big news when he spoke on Moscow radio. I had been tipped off that he was going to speak. We didn't know about what, but I had CBS set itself up for something big. Um, I, at that time, spoke quite good Russian and I listened to what Levitan said, uh, translated it to New York where it was recorded and we were able, when Khrushchev came to that key place where he said, we will pull out the means that you define as offensive and bring them back to the Soviet Union. That was the cave. That was the capitulation. It was not connected to anything on Berlin, nothing on Turkey. It was on the face of it, Khrushchev collapsing. That took unbelievable guts on his part because he had the guts to save the world from an attack, a nuclear war. And of course, in the United States, we all know sort of what happened back then, but it was a heck of a story, right? And a wonderful uh, conclusion to a terrifying week.
Thanks, Marvin. Uh, I want to come back to some of what you said and talk about your, uh, what it was like to be a foreign correspondent in the Soviet Union in general at that time. But I want to go to Juho and Lucien. Joe, um, you began your career as a CIA, a CIA officer. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about how that happened and what you did, and then whether you have any perspectives uh, from that on the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, what, is, what was the mark on the CIA or on you of that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I do want to comment on that. Well, uh, I grew up a Cold Warrior uh, and a Reaganite and wanted to do my part to destroy the evil empire which led me a few years after college to join the CIA. And then, uh, sort of to my surprise, the, about a year later, the Soviet Union collapsed. So I didn't have anything to do there anymore. So I left and I started writing novels. I wrote a spy novel. I, I ended up in Hollywood. And I will tell you that my, I, I want to comment on what Marvin said. I don't know if it's so much informed by the CIA, although it may be informed by my experience about, you know, kind of rethinking the Soviet Union and what it meant. but. Taking the facts that Marvin gave us, I would just offer a slightly different perspective, which is the United States put Jupiter missiles, nuclear missiles, in Turkey without in any way worrying about that or thinking that was a dangerous move or something we didn't move, and thereby provoked the Cuban Missile Crisis. So that's just another way to look at it, but it's obviously relevant to Ukraine and what we're all trying to figure out today, which is how things got started. So in that scenario, Khrushchev responded to that, and I agree with everything Marvin said about dangerous and reckless and bad idea and almost destroyed the world. Um, and then maybe uh, somebody else can fill us in, but I thought that generally historians now agree that uh, there was a secret agreement to bring them out before Khrushchev capitulated, and therefore his capitulation was public, appeared to be a complete capitulation, but actually was something closer to a deal. In any case, the missiles did come out. So, uh, again, I think everything Marvin said is essentially right, but you can look at it as we were almost the innocent victims of something or we provoked something. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Lucian, you've been a, a student of Russian and Soviet history. Do you have any um, uh, thing to add about the legacy of the Cuban Missile Crisis? Well, about the legacy, I mean, today it's on our minds because of what's going on in Ukraine. And I had the good fortune of speaking with one of our best uh, experts on Russia, Fiona Hill, not so long ago. And she said she doesn't like the comparison with the Cuban Missile Crisis because what Putin is doing in Ukraine is, is blackmail. And what Khrushchev and Kennedy were trying to do back then was really uh, also, as Joe just mentioned, kind of reach some kind of strategic balance. And of course, uh, what Putin is trying to sell this at home is also a search for a, a strategic balance. We need to get uh, the U.S. out of and, the, and NATO out of Ukraine, but of course the irony is uh, they were barely there uh, when this when this conflict began. You set the series in Reagan's America. Uh, maybe you can explain why you chose that particular time uh, period. My first instinct was to do the show during the '70s because I was a kid in the '70s and basically like disco music, and I thought the hair was funny. So that all seemed very good for television. But upon further consideration, how could you not put it during the Reagan era? For any of you who are old enough to remember, the Cold War, with, 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 whose intensity waxed and waned, got very intense when Reagan came to power and started calling the Soviet Union the evil empire. And suddenly, we were really at each other's throats again. I'm not saying that was the only reason, but you know, detente was over, and we wanted to destroy each other. So to have a couple of spies undercover in America at that time seemed like a little more fun. So I'd like to ask you both, like, what do you think? Did we understand each other? Do we understand each other? Let's go back to the Cold War period. Did, we, did Americans and Russians really fundamentally understand one another? I think it was a, a, it was a lot of misunderstandings. I mean, what we have to remember at the time of the Cold War, uh, this is, this is pre-internet. This is, uh, the Soviet Union was behind an iron curtain. And there was very little exchange. And the world views were very different. I think also important is that the Soviet Union had a competing ideology, which they believed in. And so I think, that, I think there were a lot of misunderstandings. And that, even in that clip, we just saw a reference to where they were coming from. Um, I, I think 
when you look at modern Russia today, uh, obviously that gulf has, has closed a lot, at least until um, Putin started his invasion in February. So I, I, do think that, I, I do think that fundamentally during the Cold War there were, there were two different mentalities. Mm -hmm. Joe, do you agree? Yeah, I would say that I was raised uh, again in the 70s and some early 80s to have a pretty one-dimensional view of the Soviet Union. It was an evil empire. It was a totalitarian state. Uh, it was completely illegitimate. The people didn't like their government. We were supposed to think the people were okay, but not the government. Uh, this is all very one-sided and one-dimensional, but I got that message at home. I got it at school. I got it in my synagogue, which was very concerned about the Jewish refuseniks who weren't being allowed to leave, and I got it in the media, and both the, popul both the movies, television, fiction, but also in journalism. That was what was presented. And of course it was the same there. Of course they were given a very, very similar one-dimensional view of America. I remember the first time I went to Russia in 1991, I was living with a Moscow family, and my host dad said, we were told all these years that we we're the richest country in the world, that we had it better than anybody else. And this was in 1991. He said, now, now we see uh, what the case is really. And, and, and it, was a, it was a feeling of betrayal, but uh, those blinders all of a sudden came off. But before that, um, I think it was really two parallel worlds. I would like to ask you um, to go back to the time that you were a correspondent in Moscow uh, in the early 1960s and tell us more about what it was like then. I mean, you actually met Khrushchev when you were a young diplomat at the American Embassy in 1957. He had a nickname for you. He called you Peter the yes. Great because you were so tall. For, for <laughs> Lucian and, and I and Joe, I think it's kind of hard to imagine that uh, Vladimir Putin would have a nickname for either of us. <laughs> So can you tell us about what was, uh, what was challenging during those years when you were trying to make sense out of the Soviet Union for Moscow? One of the things to bear in mind, and it goes back really, I think, to what I was trying to say earlier, Khrushchev was the essential element in that Russia. There was Russia and there were the Russians, and then there was Khrushchev, who was a remarkable man, a totally dedicated communist, but a man who recognized that his society was failing. And it was failing in very basic ways. It didn't have enough. Khrushchev was restless, he was footloose. He traveled all over the world. His eyes were open and he recognized the difference between that world and what it is that he led, he was trying to reform a system of government that could not be reformed. It was the same problem that Gorbachev had. He wanted very much to look at the problems, be sensible about a possible solution and apply it on an assumption that we Russians are as smart or certainly even smarter in many ways than the West, than the East, we're very special and we can do it. And what he found was that he couldn't. And one of the reasons he was driven to take the dangerous step he did in Cuba with the missiles was that he was told in February of 62 at a secret meeting on the Black Sea with his military people that although Russia had more medium and intermediate range missiles than did the West. It lacked significantly in long range missiles, which the United States had a huge superiority in. And Khrushchev realized looking at his budget, if he were to take money from the desperate uh, domestic side of the budget, and put it into more missiles, into the military side. It's the old guns butter idea. He was going to lose out, and yet he was desperate. He wanted to make the move. He wanted sort of um, strategic equality with the West and with the ability to reform his country. And what he found at the end of the day is he couldn't do it. 
And it was painful to watch, but I have to repeat, he was a remarkable man. He had an incredible sense of humor. Why would, would he call me Peter the Great? The first time we met was at the July 4th party at the American Embassy, actually at Spasso House in 1956. And he was there with the entire Politburo. And I was assigned Marshal Zhukov to look after the defense minister. Marshal Zhukov was about five, six, both in height and width. <laughs> I was six, three. And I had been a private in the United States Army dealing with a marshal of the Soviet Union. It was an idiotic kind of relationship, but we got on very well. <laughs> and and uh, Zhukov introduced me to Khrushchev. And Khrushchev looked up at me and he said, um, well, he said, how tall are you? And I had just been at the museum for Peter the Great. So I said, well, I'm four centimeters shorter than Peter the Great. Four, and he burst into laughter. He thought that was the funniest slide he'd ever heard. And when a dictator laughs, everyone around him laughs. And so it was a great hoo-ha. And from that on, from that moment on, I was for Khrushchev, Pyotr Veliki, and that, and and believe me, that was very helpful when I went back there in 1959 for CBS. It's incredibly helpful because I was able to get through any number of of lines. Russia, um, you know, you could be in Moscow. <laughs> I'm sure anyone who has been there is our panel, Beth, you have. Russia's two countries. There's the large cities like Moscow, Petersburg, and then there's the rest of Russia. And the rest of Russia is always trying to catch up. And they are still trying to catch up. And one of the most unfortunate aspects of this war is that the good people who can make that happen in Russia are fleeing. Um, what Russia can, what, one of the horrors in my mind about this war is that Russia will eventually lose it, but not only the war, but lose an opportunity for a couple of generations to get back to where they were a year or two ago. Thanks, Marvin. I mean, one thing that you did have that I think uh, Lucian and I didn't have covering, you know, the Putin era is that you had access, a lot more access than we did. Having access to anybody in the Russian government, uh, at least while I was in Russia, Lucian, you can let me know, that was increasingly difficult to the point where there was, there was no access at all. But we had technology. I mean, when I worked at CBS, we had a, our own satellite dish. We had telephones with New York phone numbers that we could pick up and dial the West at any time. <laughs> you had censorship. On that issue, um, on that October 22 night, uh, when it was clear we were in the middle of a major crisis, it took over one hour for me to get um, CBS News in New York. Um, the idea of being able to use a television was beyond our capacity, not just technologically, by the way, but the Russians wanted so much to control the image of Russia to the rest of the world. And so they were always very conscious of what it is that you did in television. And so they were always looking at the film. And if they didn't like the film you were sending out, the film somehow would get lost. Um, we ended up with the Cuban Missile Crisis being for us essentially a radio story. It was an occasional television piece, but it was a radio piece. And as far as I'm concerned, radio can do masterful things in a crisis. And that is really deal with detail and description and feelings about people. Um, sometimes a great cameraman can get the shot but I, in my judgment anyway, words are easily or more easily than pictures able to convey the emotion of the moment. Russia for that week 
was a pathetic place. You knew everything rested in the judgment of Khrushchev and his judgment clearly was faulty. Was the world gonna just stumble into a nuclear war? Did he have enough strength in the Politburo to say, Beth, that we had access? Yes, probably more than you did, but Russia was still a dictatorship. And as a dictatorship, it chose to give you only what it wanted. So you were left with your own judgment of the bits and pieces that were conveyed to you. Uh, I, I think it's terribly important for any American reporter going to Russia to be able to speak the language. The Russians are very sensitive to that. If you need a translator when you're talking to Khrushchev or Putin or whomever, um, you have already uh, dropped in their esteem considerably. So we'll go about maybe 10, 15 minutes more. I want to turn to the Putin years, and then there'll be a chance for um, audience members to ask questions. So start thinking of what you'd like to ask our panelists. Uh, Lucian, you've been covering Russia uh, pretty much since, uh, you know, you, since before Putin became uh, president, but certainly throughout his time. So how do you think um, the media has portrayed him, both in Russia and in the United States? Well, I think in the, the, the US, I, I do remember in the year 2000 when Putin really came out of the shadows uh, and was handpicked by the first Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, to be his successor. There was this question all over the place, who is Mr. Putin? And he came out of the KGB. He was the director of the FSB. Uh, he wasn't really someone uh, that, was, that was known. His, the details of his biography weren't, weren't well known. And so there was, I think there was a certain uh, fascination with him. Um, he was, uh, whereas Boris Yeltsin was known for his you know, excessive drinking and rambling speeches and just general erratic behavior, Putin was, um, was very sober-minded. Uh, he was, uh, spoke in a clipped way, seemed to know what he wanted and so there was a real contrast, and I think there was a certain fascination. Um, of course, Putin was, in 2000 was a, a different person as well. I mean, his first state visit was uh, to Great Britain, which is now uh, one, of, one of Russia's arch enemies. He was very Western-oriented, uh, or seemed to be Western-oriented in, in, in the beginning. So there was, I think there was a fascination in, in, in American media, and Russian media back then was completely different than it is now. It was very diverse. Uh, there were all sorts of voices. And um, there was one famous uh, c comedy show on, on Russian TV called Kukli, Dolls, uh, where these funny rubber uh, Muppet-like figures would uh, impersonate Russian politicians. And it was highly popular. Uh, Boris Yeltsin, when he was president, tolerated uh, this show. Uh, maybe he didn't like it very much, but he tolerated it. And um, when Putin came to power, uh, that, show, um, that show disappeared from the airwaves. And what I should say, uh, also because, just because we're in the Paley Center, is that Putin is really a, 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 te a television um, president. He was very in tune from the very beginning that he needs to control television. Uh, television was the, still the main way um, I think in the U.S. at that time as well, uh, the main source of news uh, for people. And the first thing he did when people began, maybe the first Putin euphoria uh, began to wane, uh, also at home in Russia, was when he went after NTV, which was one of the big uh, national broadcasters, um, and brought it under uh, the Kremlin's control. And um, ever since that point in the early 2000s, we've just seen uh, a gradual tightening uh, of this noose where today, I mean, it's really extreme. I left Russia in August of last year. Even compared uh, to a little bit more than a year ago, the media landscape in Russia has been completely cleared of any alternative voices. Um, all that exists now, if you uh, turn on the TV, um, or for that matter, if you go on the internet, uh, is, is, is usually uh, 
uh, the voice of, 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 of a state-sanctioned um, broadcast or media outlet. The reason I say even on, on the internet is because a lot of uh, uh, foreign social media have also been banned. For example, Facebook is now considered extremist and Twitter has been blocked. Of course, you can get around it uh, with a VPN, but that's not necessarily widespread, uh, especially as soon as, as Marvin said, as soon as you get outside of the bigger cities, also uh, the technolo technological savviness uh, goes down. Well, and Russian TV is putting out this diet of just pure propaganda, um, and certainly has been since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Do you ever watch it? Do you ever um, see what they're saying? Do you have friends who you, back in Russia, who have drunk this Kool-Aid that the West is out to get them because they're seeing it on Russian TV every day? Well, I've always said when I, I mean, you just mentioned how difficult it was uh, to get access to the Kremlin. This was definitely a problem um, for any correspondent working uh, in Russia. However, I always said, if you kind of want to know, because of the Kremlin's tight control on the media, if you want to know what they're thinking in the Kremlin, you know, watch the nightly, uh, the, the Sunday night uh, news wrap up on, um, on one of the main TV channels. Watch the news. You'll know what message people are supposed to get. Um, and so you can kind of read, uh, well, you can read between the lines, but as you said, it's now become very explicit, especially on uh, some of these more combative uh, Russian talk shows where they get in uh, these real blowhards who, um, who talk about how important it is to pummel Ukraine. It's very difficult to uh, watch these programs because they're so... Uh, deadening and their 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 message is so blunt and primitive, but it, it's it's important, you know, to keep your pulse on, uh, or to keep your hand on the pulse of, of 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 what's going on inside the Kremlin. Joe, your book covers Russia, sort of from Soviet times into the current day. What have you learned about Vladimir Putin from you know watching him over the last twenty two years? <laughs> That's a, that's a that's a big question. I, I would say that what I've what I've seen is something of a development. So I'll start by saying I think that the American media has presented something of a distorted view, um, and it reminds me of how I think the view of the Soviet Union was distorted, which is most of what was in the media then and is on the media now is true, but there's a kind of distortion by omission. You know, you're not presented other sides, you're not presented other ways of looking at it, at least in the mainstream media. It's America, you can find it. Um, but I wasn't looking for it when I was younger, so all I saw was a kind of constant diet about uh, how evil and totalitarian this place was. So with Putin, I, in my opinion, is if you track it, as you were saying, he came in and he was seen as initially somewhat more open to the West and traveling to the West and saying kind, good things, and, and people think that he wanted you know, open economic ties with the West, help build his economy. I think that was true. It wasn't a misperception. It was genuine that that's who he was. And you can pretty clearly track his change to more and more anti-Western to a series of events. So the war in Iraq seems clearly to have been a major turning point, where if you think of everything we're saying and feeling and thinking about Ukraine right now, a lot of people in Russia and the Russian leadership and Putin saw our war in Iraq exactly the same way. And he started to turn and get a little more clearly and fully anti-Western. There were elections in 2012 that he felt the U.S. was interfering in, also familiar to us. You know, and he started turning more and more against the West. And then through that same period and further, a lot of people I'm sure have heard about this, the U.S. was, or NATO was expanding closer and closer to his territory and is now the realist foreign policy school will tell you, and I generally agree with them, any state that has a state that they're a rival or an enemy of coming closer and closer to their tor territory with their defense, with their military group, is going to get scared and angry and hostile and defensive. So I think the Putin we see now, who is clearly rabidly dangerously anti-Western to the point that we're all afraid there could be a nuclear war is something, is a person that, or a politician that got built up over time with our participation in it, with our, you know, full, fully doing our part to help turn him into what he is today. Well, going back to what Marvin said, uh, you know, there are some interesting parallels to 60 years ago. 
Um, Marvin, you mentioned uh, Khrushchev wanting to be a hedgehog kind of in the side of the West. <laughs> Sort of sounds like Putin uh, invading Ukraine. You talked about Khrushchev underestimating Kennedy. Sort of sounds like Putin underestimating Zelensky uh, and uh, the Ukrainian army. Uh, that conflict ended with a letter of capitulation, but there's no indication that there's going to be any capitulation anytime soon from Putin. So what can we learn from the coverage and what happened, you know, if anything, in the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis to help us understand how we cover this particular confrontation between Russia and Ukraine? Uh, I'll open that up to anyone in the panelists who wants to jump in. No, Beth, I would say that, that we're not going to learn a great deal about Russian motivation in Ukraine, about Putin's own motivation, in my judgment anyway, unless we really understand a little bit more about Russian history. Um, two points, please. One, you make a comparison between, or I did, between Khrushchev and Putin. Um, I would like to explore that a little bit because I think there's something very important lurking in there. Um, they both took dramatic action because each for different reasons, but there is the continuum about Russia's backwardness as compared to the West and the irritation that flows from that and the annoyance that flows with that, and the belief that we're as good as they are, and we can prove it in any number of ways. Look at our people who go to the moon, not, not to the moon, but into space. The most important difference between these two men, and that's what I'm trying to emphasize, the most important difference is that if we expect Putin to take action that he knows is going to hurt himself politically, hurt Russia in terms of its relationship with the rest of the world, and still take that action, forget it. Putin is not that sort of person, but Khrushchev was. And in my book, when one thinks about the nearness of a nuclear war between the two superpowers, and you think that one of the two leaders had the guts to say publicly, I blew it. And now I'm going to live with the consequences. And it turns out that within two years, Khrushchev was out. And one of the reasons that he was out was that Brezhnev, his successor, and the people around Brezhnev spoke about Khrushchev's harebrained scheming. And they went back to Cuba. And it was a harebrained scheme. He was absolutely nutty to believe that he could get those missiles and troops in without the United States knowing it. To me, what is utterly remarkable is that you can take a society like Russia, move 50,000 troops from villages, towns, all over this vast country, get them to the Black Sea, put them on ships, get them into the Atlantic Ocean heading towards Cuba, four or 5,000 miles away, and they thought we wouldn't know anything. And when you look back upon it, the Russians could keep a secret. They knew how to keep a secret. And I keep on asking myself, well, how come we smart journalists couldn't figure this out? Well, because we couldn't. In August of 62, Che Guevara came to Moscow on a mission to buy military supplies, not to buy, he wasn't going to pay, but to get military supplies from the Soviet Union to Cuba. This was stated publicly. He was there for 12 days. We all reported that this Cuba number two guy was there. He was there for missiles, not missiles, he was there for weapons. We didn't, we couldn't imagine that Khrushchev would do something that flamboyantly ridiculous as to move all of that hardware across the Atlantic and not be spotted. And when he was spotted and Khrushchev caught and Kennedy caught him, again, Khrushchev different from Putin and 
of other Russian leaders, was prepared to save the world rather than himself. That is a remarkable guy, and that's one of the huge differences between then and now. Russian history screams at us. Study us, please. If you want to know why someone like Putin could be so obsessed with Ukraine, imagine for a moment that Ukraine has been sort of connected to Russia for 900, 1,000 years now. And Russia can't imagine Ukraine so close, sort of us, really. Your uncle is Ukrainian, your mother-in-law is Ukrainian. It's very, very close. And yet they can do things that the West can do, and we can't. They can move to the West, and we can't. Russia believes it cannot be a giant as it sees itself, unless it has the Slavic heartland under its control. That is Russia, Belarusia, Ukraine. And that heart is now being ripped apart by this war. And whether they can tolerate it, whether Russia can somehow have a leader who has the guts, again, that word, to acknowledge reality and say, we can do this too if we allow ourselves to do it. I mean, all of us who have lived in Russia for any length of time appreciates the talent that is in that country, the richness of culture. Of course they can do it, but they can't do it with people like Putin. Is there, is there another Gorbachev around? Is there another sort of Khrushchev around? Where are they? Um, is it possible? I mean, that in all of the bloodshed, that is the question for me that looms above it all. Thank you, Marvin. I want to make sure we have a chance uh, for questions from any uh, members of the audience. There's some nice uh, people with microphones who will come and uh, give you a microphone if you've got a question for one of the panelists. OK, fantastic. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Hi. Um, in the event that Putin steps down, how do you see the political landscape shift, both for Russia and then the relationship between the US and Russia? Would one of you like to try to handle that? Lucian, do you want to? Well, that's sort of the million dollar question, right? I mean, we all understand that Putin, Putin is a mere mortal, and one way or the other, uh, he will go away. And I think there are different schools of thought on what we can expect. I think um, maybe in the West, we always expect somehow uh, someone more Western-leaning or democratic, de democratically inclined uh, to come to power. But um, I think probably, especially if it's a palace coup or if he dies in power and there's uh, some intrigue around his succession, uh, you know, the likelihood that someone out of his own uh, entourage will come to power is quite high. And this might, I think Marvin's question was, you know, is there a Gorbachev or a Khrushchev uh, out there, or is it going to be uh, a, a continuation uh, of Putin? What I do think is that probably Putin's successor, um, because I think inside the Russian elite there's a recognition that uh, this war is not going as planned. I could imagine that there might be uh, an attempt by a new leader, whether they're hardline uh, or more liberally minded, I can't imagine that there will be an attempt to sort of uh, step, step back from the brink. But as long as we have Putin, uh, we are really in this uh, dangerous situation. Oh, thank you for the question. Uh-huh, well, here we'll go here and then to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Bringing this up to date, uh, I haven't heard the word China. And I think China is a very important factor now. Uh, certainly, perhaps, as an off-ramp for the war. Can you talk about that a little bit, the unlimited friendship and how China may be pushing Putin to, uh, to do something? So the question is, what is China's role in all of this? I mean, I think there's a certain amount of uh, consensus on the fact that Putin has run out of friends, right? I mean, when we look at uh, 
who supported the resolution in the United Nations yesterday. It was uh, three or four countries besides Russia. Um, and China, of course, abstaining. And China's position right now is, I think, to sit in the wings and watch, uh, watch how this plays out. Uh, I, I think China is often portrayed as, uh, the word ally is often used in headlines. Uh, China is by no means an ally uh, of, of Russia. I think Russia, in the past few years under Putin, um, has, they have liked to pose together with uh, China, not only with Xi Jinping, but also Russian uh, soldiers or the Russian Navy uh, tra training uh, with the Chinese military. But this, a lot of this is for show. And I think, uh, I think when, if, if we look at, in practical terms, what's happening, China uh, is getting certain benefits. Maybe it can get energy and other resources, which R Russia can't sell on the world market. Maybe China's uh, getting some discounts there. But we're also, uh, we also know that China isn't really rushing to fill uh, certain, certain um, breaks in, in Russian supply chains, I'm, I, I mean in, in, in technological sense, because they fear, uh, they fear uh, being a victim of, uh, or, or being affected by Western sanctions. So from my understanding is that China uh, is, is taking a wait and see um, attitude. One thing that's also important to remember, since we are talking about the context of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, China is uh, one of the main nuclear powers, and in that sense is very much a status quo power. Uh, the Chinese do not want to see Putin creating some new precedents by uh, using nuclear weapons, whether it's on the battle, uh, tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield or, or threatening something much larger. So it's something, uh, this relationship is in many ways very intransparent. We don't exactly, we, we can't see very deeply inside it, but um, I don't think that we're necessarily seeing the Chinese approve of what's happening and, uh, and probably taking as much benefit as they can from Russia's weakened status in that relationship. I think we could probably do in another hour, at least, on China and Russia. So thank you for the question. This is a question for, for Marvin, mostly, actually. Um, thank you for, for joining us virtually. I want to ask a little bit about this access. Um, the fact that in 1962, you could just be at the ballet and run into Khrushchev backstage. I mean, you know, I'm a working journalist. Lucian and I have, have done a lot of this together, and I know Lucian's had good access when, when he was a staff staffer in Moscow, but still nothing like that, right? I mean, how were you able to do that? Did he have any guards at all, or was it just <laughs> that they would wave you through because they knew you, or, you know, some vodka exchanged, or? <laughs> <laughs> no, no vodka exchange. Um, if I suggested to you that it was easy and that uh, access was a piece of cake, I totally misspoke. What I was trying to say was, there was, I think, a special relationship in Khrushchev's mind to me personally. And it developed in the way in which I described it. Uh, we met in that way. He thought it was very funny, uh, the line that I'd given him. And Peter the Great stuck in his mind. He too, like Putin, would like to be measured up against Peter the Great. And it was a funny line in his mind. He had a very good sense of humor. And it was something that related to me. It was my good luck that I was 6'3 and 170 pounds. He liked that idea. So when I was there in the audience watching an American performer in Moscow in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis, who should be there but Khrushchev? That in and of itself was a news story. Khrushchev was paying his respects to an American artist in the middle of this crisis. Khrushchev picked himself up and started walking from the um, small balcony, really, that he was there, attached somehow to the stage at the Bolshoi. We were in the fifth row in the front. The minute I saw him walking toward the back, I assumed that he was going back there to say something to a man 
whom I knew through my wife's South Orange, New Jersey connections. That's a so separate story. But so I simply said, what the hell? And I followed him. And because he saw me, he waved off his security people and I was allowed to follow him in. And then he wanted to leave a certain message with the Western press. I happened to be there. But please don't think for an instant that it was easy and that happened every day. It did not. It was as all Western correspondents working in the Soviet Union and today as well. It's hard to get through to people. There is a great deal of suspicion. There's a great deal of anger that you have it and they don't. That is in their minds. Um, and I repeat, if you speak Russian, if you know about Russian history, if you talk to them with some understanding, they believe you're not like them. You're not talking down to them. You're trying to learn things and um, you're there to be a reporter. You're not there to, to attack them. Um, I think that some of that becomes apparent to Russian officials after they work with you. Okay, uh, this is a question to Peter the Great. Um, you know, from a diplomatic, despite all of the atrocities that Putin has done during the last month, uh, from a diplomatic perspective, do you see that um, NATO's um, what has been done, I mean, like a provocation of getting Ukraine into NATO, similar to what happened back in 62 when we had that, uh, that uh, military um, facilities in Turkey. Do you see that as a provocation? I was one of those people at the end of the Cold War who felt that the movement of NATO toward Eastern Europe and then toward, the, toward Russia was a fundamental mistake. Um, I believe it to this day. Um, if NATO had not moved as it did, would it have changed Putin? I don't know. I don't think anything really could have changed Putin except, except if Ukraine clearly wanted to stay as part of the Slavic world rather than the Western world. If Putin had seen that, he would not have felt as threatened by the West as he ended up feeling. So it's very hard to figure it out, but um, I've always believed that it was a, a bit of a blunder to have reached too far too fast and to have reached into Russian fears in a way that was not really necessary. Rather than ending on nuclear uh, near Armageddon, I, I thought we might, uh, I might get in one very last quick question for Joe. If you were going to um, set a new TV series in the Putin years, have you ever thought about what it might be? <laughs> well, that's a tough one. People have often asked me if you could do a version of the Americans, you know, in the Soviet Union, but nobody can figure out how an American could go in and pretend to be a Russian very effectively and, and, the, and the police presence is just too much to pull that off. Uh, I think I will, if I may, instead of answering your question, I'll just end with a very, because it's appropriate to our talk and everything Marvin was saying, I'll end with a quick Khrushchev story, my favorite Khrushchev story, and we can end on a happy note, which is, uh, this comes from Solzhenitsyn, in, in, who writes in the Gulag Archipelago, that he met uh, Khrushchev's driver. And this is not a joke, it's a true story. Khrushchev's driver was, I mean, he met him in a prison camp, I think. But Khrushchev's driver had driven for Stalin, for Khrushchev, and later for Brezhnev. And he said the only one he liked was Khrushchev because supposedly they were supposed to be living in a classless society and only Khrushchev treated him nicely, treated him like a member of the family and had him come sit down at his table with his family for dinner, so. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joe Weisberg, Lucian Kim, Marvin Kalb. Thank you to the Paley Center for this event.